here is represented as a simple sphere. Blood enters and exits this chamber via structures that act as natural electrical barriers. There are three veins that bring blood into the right atrium, including the superior vena cava, the inferior vena cava, and the coronary sinus, which enters the inferior aspect of the interatrial septum. Blood exits the right atrium via the tricuspid valve. This is essentially a left anterior oblique or LAO view, and so the tricuspid valve is sitting toward us, and the right ventricle would be on our side of the screen as we're viewing the chamber from this direction. The crista terminalis is a muscle ridge that runs down the lateral aspect of the right atrium, and in most people, the muscle fibers that run along this ridge are oriented in the top to bottom direction, which means that electrical signals tend to travel much better and faster downward or upward along the crista terminalis along its length rather than transverse or across the crista terminalis. So this ridge structure acts essentially as a functional electrical barrier in most patients. The space between the inferior vena cava and the tricuspid valve is known as the cavo-tricuspid isthmus. And just to refresh your memory from grade school, an isthmus, geographically speaking, is a narrow strip of land that connects two larger land areas. But anatomically speaking, an isthmus is a narrow anatomic part that connects two larger structures or cavities. Let's take a moment and pretend that we're floating inside the right atrium and look downward at that cavotricuspid isthmus. Here we are staring downward, and let's see what that would look like. Here's what the cavotricuspid isthmus would look like if we stare at it looking downward from the middle of the right atrial chamber. Posteriorly, you have the inferior vena cava, which serves as one border, and anteriorly, you have the inferior portion of the tricuspid valve or the tricuspid annulus. And you can therefore see that there's a narrow portion that connects the lateral aspect of the right atrium to the medial aspect of the right atrium and the interatrial septum. Therefore, this is an isthmus by definition. Now that we appreciate the right atrial anatomy and the natural barriers that occur in the right atrium, we can start talking about the various flutter circuits that are possible. The most common one is counterclockwise right atrial flutter, also known as typical flutter because it is the most common. There's a very characteristic path or circuit that's followed during typical flutter, and that includes a wavefront traveling up the interatrial septum, across the roof of the right atrium, down the lateral wall of the right atrium in front of the crista terminalis, and then across that cavotricuspid isthmus, that portion between the inferior vena cava and the tricuspid valve, which I'm going to show here in green. Another term that's used for typical flutter is isthmus-dependent flutter because this wavefront necessarily must travel across that cavotricuspid isthmus in order for this particular circuit to perpetuate. Typical flutter has a typical appearance on the EKG, where in the inferior leads, 2, 3, and AVF, you have negative flutter waves with a very gradual downslope and a more rapid upstroke, here shown with the red arrows. The reason that there's a superior axis of the flutter waves is probably twofold. First, the wavefront travels in an upward direction on the interatrial septum, and second, the wavefront, when it travels from right atrium to left atrium, crosses that septum at the part of the, uh, where the uh, coronary sinus connects the two chambers. And so the left atrium is also activated in a bottom to top direction. And because of that bottom to top direction, you have a wavefront that travels upward, creating those negative flutter waves in the inferior leads. In V1, you typically see the opposite orientation with positive flutter waves there, and this likely reflects the wavefront coming toward V1, toward the front of the chest, across the top of the right atrium. And here's a terrific 3D electroanatomic map showing the sequence of activation and wavefront propagation in both the right and the left atrium during counterclockwise right atrial flutter. And before we get into it, I want to first thank Dr. David Singh and several other people who have posted fantastic videos and images on Twitter to share with the EP community and beyond. I really appreciate their, first of all, posting these wonderful images, and second of all, allowing me to share them in this presentation.
So here we're going to start this movie in motion, showing wavefront propagation traveling across the cavotricuspid isthmus, up the interatrial septum, which I'm showing with a yellow arrow, as well as that connection near the coronary sinus, showing an inferior to superior wavefront propagation in the left atrium as well. Let's watch that a second time and note the wavefront traveling in an upward direction during counterclockwise right atrial flutter, and that explains the negative flutter waves in the inferior leads. Now, if we look at the reverse circuit, which is the same in its route but the opposite in direction, this is clockwise right atrial flutter, where the wavefront will travel in this case down the interatrial septum, across the cavotricuspid isthmus in the opposite direction, up the lateral wall of the right atrium, again in front of the crista terminalis, and then back over the roof toward the top of the interatrial septum once again. This also travels through the cavotricuspid isthmus, and so it's also essentially referred to as isthmus-dependent flutter because, again, the wavefront necessarily must travel through that isthmus between the IVC and the tricuspid valve. Here on the 12 lead EKG, you're going to see flutter waves of opposite direction, positive in the inferior leads 2, 3, and AVF because the wavefront in this case is traveling downward on the interatrial septum. And when there's a clockwise circuit in the right atrium, now the communication between right and left atrium occurs over Bachmann's bundle, the top of the chambers, and the wavefront travels in a downward direction in the left atrium as well, giving you those positive flutter waves in leads two, three, and AVF. And again, the opposite is seen in V1, where these flutter waves during clockwise right atrial flutter are negative, reflecting a front to back component of the flutter circuit and activation of the atria. Here again is another terrific video from Dr. Singh showing clockwise right atrial flutter, emphasizing the sequence of activation on the septum and in the left atrium, showing a top to bottom direction. Here we're going to see a wavefront travel across the top of the right atrium, down the interatrial septum, downward in the left atrium as well, and then of course across the cavotricuspid isthmus on the floor of the right atrium. Let's watch that one more time, again explaining why the flutter waves in clockwise right atrial flutter are positive in the inferior leads. Let's now talk about how we place catheters in the heart for an atrial flutter ablation procedure. The purpose of putting catheters in the heart is to record wavefront propagation and therefore we sample the electrograms at various places around the right atrium and in the coronary sinus. So typically people will use a multi-electrode catheter that's looped around the right atrium, often in this configuration, having 10 or 20 poles, meaning 5 or 10 bipoles in pairs. And the purpose of placing this at this location is to be able to record electrograms down the lateral wall of the right atrium, across the isthmus, and into the coronary sinus. And I reviewed in my electrogram lecture how these electrodes are numbered. We can either number them as uh, pairs, like here, where we have electrode pair 1, electrode pair 2, all the way up to electrode pair 10. And by the way, this catheter having 20 poles is called a duodeca catheter, so these may be labeled on the screen when we're looking at the electrograms as D1 through D10. Sometimes instead of numbering pairs of electrodes, you'll see people label all the electrodes individually, and on the screen of the electrograms, you'll see labels such as duodeca 1, 2, duodeca 3, 4, and onward. And that's just individual preference, how it's displayed on the screen, but I just wanted to review those so that when you see various people showing electrograms during atrial flutter, you'll understand their numbering scheme. Here we see the duodeca catheter with pairs of electrodes numbered, and now I've highlighted that cavotricuspid isthmus again in green, showing that we do have electrodes on the isthmus and on either side of it. Here is that counterclockwise right atrial flutter pathway, showing that the wavefront travels around the chamber as we reviewed before, and then of course also extending out the coronary sinus from a right to left direction. 
Here's an actual duodecapolar catheter sitting in the right atrium with the tip extending into the coronary sinus in a patient with typical atrial flutter. We again number the electrodes from the tip of the catheter backwards. And on this LAO fluoroscopy view, let me superimpose the anatomic structures so that you can appreciate exactly how this catheter sits. The catheter is looped around the right atrium with electrodes traveling down the lateral wall, across the isthmus, and into the coronary sinus. And the tricuspid valve is facing out at us in this LAO view. Here is the wavefront propagation sequence traveling around the right atrium in a counterclockwise direction, and of course traveling out the coronary sinus in a right to left direction, anatomically speaking. Pay attention to the sequence that the electrodes are being activated during this flutter circuit, and we're going to review that in the next module. Here I've removed the anatomic structures to again highlight the path of the circuit and looking at the sequence of electrodes as this wavefront travels counterclockwise around the right atrium. One last point about catheter positioning is that it's very important in the RAO view to ensure that your catheter is sitting in front of the crista terminalis. Here I've drawn in the crista terminalis and showing the catheter in an incorrect position with the body of the catheter sitting posterior to the crista. The reason why this is a problem is that the wavefront travels anterior to the crista in typical flutter. And if you're going to be doing entrainment maneuvers or interpreting activation sequence, you can sometimes be misled about the nature of flutter if your electrodes are positioned behind this electrical barrier rather than in front where the circuit's actually traveling. Here in this patient, we torqued the catheter a little bit in order to bring the catheter now in front of the crista terminalis. And that's going to be much more useful as you interpret electrograms and entrainment maneuvers, which we'll review in a little bit, because again, the wavefront is going to be traveling along the catheter now between the tricuspid annulus and the crista terminalis.